uh, our site, which is called MC Mississippi, Mississippi Canyon 118. Um, we're looking now at the seafloor from above, a bird's eye view. It's about one kilometer across in diameter. And this is the bathymetry of the seafloor. So it's quite rough in an otherwise pretty flat system. Um, so we wanted to, oh, then we looked at with, um, with cameras, with remotely operated vehicles, looking at the different features around this, uh, this seep. So there's areas where we have uh, clams in the, the western or in the eastern part. There are areas where we have gas plumes coming out of the seafloor and those carbonate crusts that I mentioned, the orthogenic carbonates. The sleeping dragon is also found in this region. So a close up of those ice worms um, here and the oxide of the sleeping dragon. And then bacterial mats. So it's quite diverse with what's there. Um, and we often say that these features are a seafloor expression of that upward moving fluid coming from below. This was the video. I don't know if it's going to, it probably won't work. Um, but I'll describe this video. This is looking at a, at a, a seafloor vent. So this stuff right here are bubbles coming out of the seafloor. And I love showing this picture because um, this crab is down there, so there is biology um, more than microbial. Um, and, and he comes over, or she comes over to the bubble stream and starts to eat the, the bubbles. Um, and to really show that thermodynamics works, the bubbles as they go, as he's pulling them into his mouth, um, it forms gas hydrate under his chin. So you can see this white froth just start to form. And that's because we're in that, that stability zone for hydrate to form instantaneously um, as long as the, the bubbles aren't moving so fast. So it's kind of a neat illustration of, of uh, how that should work. Um, so th I just wanted to quickly show why there's oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico and how it comes up. There's a, a deep salt reservoir in the Gulf of Mexico due to the formation of the basin. And over time, that organic matter has been cooked uh, to make a deep gas and petroleum reservoir. The salt is less dense than the surrounding sediment, so it starts to move up through the sediments and create faults and fissures. So that's actually in a passive margin like the Gulf of Mexico why there are faults in those sediments. Um, and those faults may reach the, the seafloor, and that's what we're seeing um, at a place like the Mississippi Canyon 118. Um, fluids then can m migrate along these pathways. And if it's within that hydrate stability zone, then, then we see the hydrates. OK, so I'm trying to make this connection between the deep reservoir and the seafloor. Um, so we were wondering about the control of, um, of methane flux due to that, the deep plumbing. And so these colored lines here are showing the faults that are connected to that deep gas and petroleum reservoir. And so what we wanted to do was just core the heck out of it. So all those black dots are sediment cores that we collected um, from seven expeditions over four years. So it's about 70 cores. And just ask the simple question, or the hypothesis that you'll see more uh, flux and most likely microbial activity along these faults where the gas is coming up. So we do that by collecting sediment cores and then processing the pore water fluids within the, the sediments and measuring for um, many constituents sulfates to look at sulfate reduction. Of course, we're measuring methane. And then we use stable isotopes to look at sources and uh, sinks of the methane. Um, oops, excuse me. I'm missing the equation for for the stable isotopic ratio, but it's the ratio of the, the heavy carbon to the light carbon compared to a standard. And that can tell you something about where it's coming from, where the methane is coming from and where it's going. So we see typical, we get profiles like this in the bottom here, where we have, this is depth now in the sediments, so we're centimeters uh, below seafloor, down to about five meters. And we're looking at sulfate, methane, the stable isotopes of methane and the dissolved inorganic carbon. So dissolved inorganic carbon is one of these byproducts of microbial processing. 
So I'm just kind of showing what we can find and what it might look like if there's sulfate reduction, the sulfate will be consumed. And then um, because methanogenesis is a competitive process to sulfate reduction, methane then becomes generated through methanogenesis. Um, you can see that in the isotopes as well. Um, the, um, the very light methane is from methanogenesis. And, uh, and because, of, because methane is coming from carbon dioxide, you see a shift in, in, uh, in the del C13 to heavier values below. As that methane is diffusing into the sulfate reduction zone, remember there's that anaerobic methane oxidation process. And so with that, you see a shift to heavier values. The methane is being oxidized. The um, microbes use the lighter carbon. And so um, the remaining methane that's left gets heavier. So that's why you see that shift. And, the pro and the, um, you see a mirror image in the dissolved inorganic carbon. OK, so this is what the data looks like. Um, I've grouped them into uh, moderately moderate activity of microbes because the sulfate values do not go down like I showed in the earlier slide, don't go down to zero very quickly. So this is down to about one meter. We see a little bit of methane buildup um, up to about 20 uh, micromolar. Remember that saturation value is in millimolar, so we're looking at much lower concentrations. Um, there's not much happening with the stable isotopes. Um, again, there's, this is a moderate activity um, uh, grouping of cores. But if we look at the high activity, we see sulfate is reduced by 50 centimeters or so. Um, methane is, is reaching saturation at one atmosphere. There's a problem when we measure methane in these deep sea systems because it degasses in the traditionally collected cores. Um, so you only see up to about saturation at one atmosphere, uh, which is, uh, in this case, about 2,000 micromolar. Um, you can get a little higher if you're fast. Um, so we usually process these from the bottom up of the cores. And then we see the, the, the typical methane oxidation signature and methanogenesis. This core right here, you can see a tailing at about minus 50. That's that thermogenic source um, coming up uh, for deep below. And then again, we have the microbial processing in the, in the upper. So if we look at all of those cores together on the map again with the faults, you see a picture that looks like there's red is indicating high activity. Again, sulfate is reduced in the very shallow sediments, um, sort of scattered about the whole site. Um, and so it, you know, our hypothesis that it's connected to the, the faults themselves is a little bit hard to see in, in this collection of cores. Um, but one of the main questions then is how much is, of this methane is getting out of the sediments? So we can do that by calculating a methane flux right at the surface of the sediments uh, using for, fixed first law um, where we look at the gradient um, and we know the diffusion coefficient. If we look at that, the picture looks a little, little bit different. You see that the methane flux to the sediment water interface is pretty low across the whole site. So while there's all this methane and all this microbial activity, they're very efficient at oxidizing this methane. So little, very little is, is coming out. This is the diffusive flux. So we still have bubbles, but the diffusive flux is, is, um, is controlling a lot of that, again, through that anaerobic methane oxidation process. Um, you might be wondering about those bubbles then. That's a pretty fast transit of methane out of these systems, and that's right. Um, but there is a microbial role there as well. I won't go into this because um, I don't really study the bubbles, but there's a lot of work looking at the transport from bubbles um, from seeps to the atmosphere. And what they're finding is that most of that methane is getting oxidized in that water column before it actually reaches the, the atmosphere. So again, while there's a huge reservoir of methane here, um, little bit is actually getting to the atmosphere. There are some exceptions, and in the Gulf of Mexico is one of those where um, the bubbles themselves can either have oil coatings on the bubbles or even gas hydrate coatings as a way to preserve the methane until it reaches the overlying mixed water, uh, mixed layer. 
and that could be one way to get methane to the sea to the atmosphere. But just to kind of show the the variety of seeps around the world, this is the site offshore Svalbard in in the Arctic Ocean. Um, this is looking into the water column with seismics. You can see gas bubbles. These red gas flares or bubble vents are just emanating from the seafloor. This is thought to be uh, warming waters, dissociating the gas hydrates that are in the sediments below. Um, the real issue is if you don't have that really uh, thick water column above the seeps. So he, there's uh, seeps offshore California. Um, and this is where seeps from lakes and reservoirs that a lot of work is being done here is really important to, to characterize because that has a large opportunity to get to the atmosphere directly. Okay, so now we're going to look at, we've talked about the spatial extent of methane flux at temporal. So what kind of change might we see over, over time in these hydrate systems? So I hope one of the goals of this talk is to kind of expose you to the deep sea and see that it's, there's a lot going on down there um, and th things do change over time. Um, we didn't really know that was going to happen, but in 2006, about three days before we went on our research expedition, there was an earthquake in the, um, in the Gulf of Mexico, which is very rare. It was a 5.6 magnitude, so a pretty big one. And when we went down to the site, we saw features that were new that we hadn't seen before. So this is a gas hydrate outcrop here and a very fresh um, break of gas hydrate, the white stuff here. And that's not normal. Usually you see sediment covering these, these hydrates. And so something changed with that er earthquake. Um, we went back to the same feature four years later and we saw this. So it looks very different. Much more, um, a lot more shells around. Um, this actually had ice worms colonizing it. Um, so we know, we know that things are happening. And this can only be done with these observing systems that, are out, that, are, um, that we had out there. So I wanted to then ask, well, what's happening with the methane flux with, with, um, with perturbations like we saw? So this is where I get into the technical part the, of approaches, the methods that we use. Um, you could use sensors, mass specs, um, to go down and look at methane concentrations over time. Those are used in the group that I'm working with does use them. Um, they take a lot of power and they're usually pretty expensive to maintain. Um, and the amount of time that you can leave them out there is controlled by that battery power. So I consider myself a more simple chemist. Um, so I went to a pour water collection device. This uh, uses a sampler called an Osmo sampler that was designed at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute um, in California. And here's a picture of it. All it is is a, a tube that has different chambers in it. Um, these chambers, one has uh, fresh water, just um, DI water, and then there's a semi-permeable membrane that um, separates it from a saturated salt solution. So essentially this pump works by osmosis. So water diffuses across the membrane um, because of the salt difference and that diffusion creates a pump. So this pump then is connected to very long tubing um, that you put your sample inlet if you want to collect from water or from the sediments. You put that, that inlet at that place and water will then move through the tubing over time. It's a pretty slow pump, so it can be on the order of a couple hundred microliters per day to half a mil per day, depending on temperature. If it's warmer, they'll pump faster. And so what I did is I put a bunch of these Osmo samplers in an Osmo sampler package, essentially a box, that sits on top of a, a cement weight, and the, the plumbing, the tubing, is plumbed down the center of this box, down a, a probe that goes into the mud. And there's little filter tips that are along this, this probe. So this instrument gets deployed like a gravity core, just by weight, you throw it over the side of a ship, and the whole package gets thrown into the mud. So this probe will then be in the mud, um, and this part will be sticking out of the sediment. Um, there's a, a low volume fluid coupler in between the, the uh, samplers themselves and the ports. 
And so the idea is that once this thing is in place, it stays down there. You can go to with an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, go to this box, take it off, replace it, and you get a time series for as long as, as you can get funding, essentially. <laughs> that, um, because we're looking at methane, and I told you there's a problem with degassing with traditionally collected cores, uh, we use copper tubing for this tubing um, that's connected to the samplers, and also a high pressure valve. So the valve is, is um, tying off the, the, the copper tubing. So it goes down in an open position. All of the sample can be collected in, in the copper tubing. And then when it's done, the ROV closes that valve, switches off so that the, the copper tubing is now isolated. When you bring that up, it doesn't degas. Um, yeah. uh, the valve is, there's this little circle right here on the side of the box. So it's inside the box. And that gives access to the ROV to go in and turn the valve. Yeah, so it's just a manual valve. Yeah. So here's a picture of a real sampler. You can see the membranes here and all the salt uh, here. And then uh, this is the, the copper tubing. This is very small, thin um, diameter tubing that's about 300 meters long, this coil right here. Um, and that will get us in the deep sea about a year's worth of sample at the pumping rates. Once we're done, once the sample is collected, you bring everything back, and then you unspool the copper coil and cut sections in the copper. You just crimp it off, um, and those sections equate to time because you know the diameter, you know, you know the dimensions of the tubing, and you know the pumping rate based on temperature. So you can calculate then a time point with essentially distance. Um, and you can take pretty high resolution depending on what you're looking at. These were designed for many other constituents, not just methane. Um, you can use Teflon tubing to look at uh, lots of other things. Uh, this is just a picture of what the port looks like. There's a filter right here, and that's the, the probe that goes into the mud. This particular one is a 10 meter long probe. We've, we have another one that has an 8 meter long probe as well. And that's a picture of the coupler that goes between here. So we have two systems out at the, the field site in the Gulf of Mexico that we've deployed over the years. And I'll, so this is, this is where those two are, are from. And I'll show you one small snippet of that data. Um, this is what it looks like then on the seafloor. Um, the, the, the port didn't, the probe didn't go all the way into the mud. Um, just because it was too consolidated, which is why we went to the 8 meter probe in the next version. But we did get sample then from overlying water, essentially right here, and, um, and then about 1.3 meters below the seafloor. That's the data that I'll show. Oh, that doesn't show up. <laughs> okay, I will describe to you what you would see here. <laughs> um, that's weird. So this is concentrations. There's two plots here, one of the overlying water and one in the poor water. Um, the overlying water concentrations are in the order of micromolar, uh, so again, really low. And then the, well, you can see this is time, days in the past. So the most recent, when we picked up the instrument, was the zero, and then it was about uh, four months back. We had about a four-month record. So concentrations in the bottom water were pretty pretty low, what we would expect from a from water from a seep site, but at the very last month the concentrations went up to about 100 micromolar, which is pretty low, pretty high in water. Um, and in the poor water we saw the same trend, but the concentrations were of course much higher because we're in the poor water. Um, so the scale on here would have been millimolar. We actually got up to about 15 millimolar um, concentrations. So it, the, most of the time record was one or two millimolar, and then in this last four months, we got up to about 15 millimolar. So it showed that we could measure in situ concentrations, but then this time part was a surprise. We didn't know we'd see such variation. So I went back into um, the record because we knew that we had this large earthquake uh, right when we picked up the instrument, essentially, um, or when we uh, 
yeah, when we picked it up. And um, in fact, there was an earlier earthquake um, that happened around the same time. There were, I forgot about this in the record, there was a little bit of an increase around this June time point in the concentrations, not as high as what we saw at the end. Um, but it looked like there was some indication that these earthquakes affected what was coming out of the seafloor. Um, and in fact, we even saw a, a, like a precursor. Maybe there were pre-tremors or something that led up to the earthquake before in the methane record. So this was really very exciting and interesting to see you know, natural perturbations releasing or being a potential release of this methane. Um, and so I, I was very enthralled with this idea of earthquakes and there's, there was no, very little work had been done on it, some, a couple of papers, but, but they didn't really have a, a time series. Um, so I went to a place that there's a lot of earthquakes. This is offshore Vancouver Island in the Pacific where there are seeps as well. Um, and this is a picture, so here we're off the west coast of the U.S., so Washington State, Vancouver Island. Uh, Pacific Ocean, and here was our field site. All of these yellow dots indicate earthquakes that occurred during the time series when I had instruments out there. They were all in the order of magnitude, less than magnitude three, so nothing too big. Um, of course, I didn't know that before I put it out there, but that's what happened. Um, and so to do this, I used the same idea with that large sampler, the pore fluid array, and miniaturized it so that an ROV could, to, could take this box and put it um, very pointedly to a certain spot. Um, and that's what this looks like. This is just a, a box that stands on the desktop with Osmo samplers within it. And then this movable wand that has, instead of that long probe tip, you can take a, just a, a PVC stick and put your ports there and you can put it wherever you want with the ROV. So we did that at a seep um, shown here. It's not very, there's not a lot of chemosynthetic communities. We actually think it's a very new seep, so there hasn't been time to, for the communities to grow in. Um, and this is the data that we see. So this is time. It's about a nine-month record. And methane concentrations in the overlying water. Um, so this is a PPM. It's a little bit of a different scale to think about. But um, essentially, you know, an air is about 2 ppm, so very low concentrations, what we'd expect. And then there were two spikes that occurred um, where the concentrations really increased during the time series. So my hypothesis then was that there should have been earthquakes, or could have been. Uh, is that what caused this, this uh, release? Um, in the poor waters, we saw similar increase during the time of the two spikes in the overlying water. But I'll point out here, the scale is in millimolar. Um, and we and saturation at this field site is about 60 millimolar. So we were able to measure um, 40 to 50 uh, almost saturated in the pore waters. So this was a, a great technical um, advance with the instruments. We hadn't measured that before. And you see that increase from the pore waters as well. We looked at the earthquakes during the time series, and again, there were lots. Uh, but but they're pretty small, and there was nothing that indicated something large during the the release of the of the methane. So we were left to wonder what what caused it. Um, we're still scratching our heads. We this this work was part of a, a, an observatory station that's out there now, but this but our record was before they had a lot of instrumentation down there. So we didn't have a lot of ancillary data to pull from, but, but we did have temperature record from the bottom water. And that's what's here. You can see this really sharp decrease in bottom water temperature within a couple weeks when those spikes happened. So we think something oceanographic happened, either an upwelling event or um, something we don't really know. We don't have current speed if it sped up or anything like that, but uh, very uh, tantalizing data. Um, so we, we know then that we're actually, I'm thinking that maybe there's this threshold of earthquake activity. The Gulf of Mexico is not used to earthquakes. The Pacific coast is, and so you might need something much larger than what you typically see in the Pacific. Um, but how much time do I, I don't know when I started. Is it quarter till? 
So maybe 15 minutes? Okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, we kind of learned that this earthquakes could be a factor, but then the oceanography certainly needs to be built in there with these deep sea um, observatory systems. Um, so then deep water horizon happened. <laughs> um, essentially, we had been gathering all this information about natural seeps in the deep sea, and in fact, that Mississippi Canyon 118 site from the Gulf of Mexico is about 14 kilometers away from Deepwater Horizon. So our gears sort of switched from, um, well, looking at natural perturbations to uh, unnatural, I would say. Um, and so I'm going to show some data from the, the Deepwater Horizon work that we're doing. So just to orient you with the spill, um, this occurred in April 2010. Um, there was a gas blowout that caused the explosion and the eventual um, sinking of the rig. Also, it's always important to remember that 11 crew members died during this. This was a, a horrific event. Um, and two days later, the whole rig sank. Um, it was the longest, in the end, the long largest offshore oil spill in U.S. history, for sure. It uh, spilled for about 87 days. It, and has been estimated to be about 4.9 million barrels of oil total during the whole event. Um, to put that into perspective, the U.S. uses about 19 million. Um, so it, it was pretty considerable um, amount of oil. A recent estimate has shown that about 4 to 31 percent of this oil uh, reached the seafloor. So they added dispersants at the um, at the wellhead to try to keep the oil from going to the surface and getting to the shoreline um, and affecting the coastal system. Um, but the result of that is then that oil was laid down in the deep sea. Um, uh, just some statistics on the, the dispersants that were used. And of course, there were lots of damage to marine life. Um, a lot of oil did make it to the, the coastal ocean. And um, certainly work and investigations are still ongoing. Um, if you can call it a silver lining, the silver lining is that there was a commitment to research, a long-term commitment by uh, BP, or they were they had to. <laughs> um, they invested $500 million over the next 10 years to understanding what happened and how we can avoid things like this, or not avoid it, but if it happens again, how we can respond quickly, um, and what's the best thing to do. Was it good to add the dispersants? Was it not? You know, what did it do? What's the long-term effect? Uh, this is unprecedented in deep sea research. It's very difficult to get funded and certainly for long term. So uh, we see it as a, a silver lining. So in the first year, they put about $40 million um, into the, the Gulf states to study. Um, by the second year, they the, the, there was an independent research panel that was gathered um, to administer the, the funds. Um, and they selected eight of these large research consortia teams to study different aspects of the oil spill. So I was involved in one of those that was successful in getting funded. Uh, six of the, the large programs are, are interested in the coastal aspects, and this one, two of them are doing deep sea work um, to look at, uh, look at the, the, the effects on the ecosystems. So the, the group is the Ecosystems Impact of Oil and Gas Inputs to the Gulf. We call ourselves EcoGig. We love acronyms. And it really was to understand the impact of the oil on the deep water communities. This was led by work from University of Mississippi. So our big question then was, what is the impact of large scale perturbations? Um, and we're looking at everything, oil and gas release, tectonics, and even storm activities, lots of hurricanes in the, in the Gulf on the deep water um, seep ecosystems. So the approach that my small group, uh, there's about 15 investigators in EcoGig, um, and I lead a team of four. And what we were really wanting to do was conduct in situ experiments um, over time at, the, at natural seep sites. So the PFA, the poor fluid array instrument that I showed you, the big thing at first, we miniaturized it to go to seeps pointedly. And it now evolved into something we call MIMOSA. This is the Microbial Methane Observatory for Seafloor Analysis. Um, here's a picture of a MIMOSA tree and a MIMOSA drink. 
quite nice. Champagne and orange juice is good. Um, and but it's the same idea. It uses Osmo sampler technology um, to collect samples for methane, um, which is the part that I'm leading. But we use the samplers also to look at the microbial communities over time. So no longer are we just looking at geochemistry. We're looking at the microbes that are associated with that geochemistry and the change. We also look at trace metals. There is a lot of, uh, uh, well, some trace metals coming out of the, the oil spill. So we can use it to, to track um, what happened with the oil spill. And then we have ways we can do um, experiments using Osmo samplers on the seafloor. And so we put all these things together into one package that we call Mimosa. And this is what it looks like. Uh, we put the Osmo samplers inside of these boxes that go down on a lander. This is essentially an elevator that we can deploy from a ship um, and leave it down there for a year at a time. And the, the wand, you know, the, the port um, movable wand that the other instruments have, we have the same thing on this. You can actually see it right here. This is the PVC stick um, where all the, the Osmo samplers are connected up to doing all those different analyses. So it's a continuously collected um, fluids for looking at a variety of things all in one. Um, here's a close-up of the probe in the mud. Uh, I will say we've had a lot of technical difficulties in getting the proper sample. Um, the ROVs are, have not been our friends. So we get things like this where it's not actually in the mud or half of it's in the mud uh, due to, to issues. But we've been able to, to show some work. Um, so the site that I will show data from is very close to the Deepwater Horizon, uh, this dot right here, and then a natural oil seep um, a little bit further away, but about the same water depth. So we want to compare what happened with the oil spill to natural seeps. This is what it looks like on the, on the deck of the ship before deployment. We have all the samplers here. The, the lander itself has um, flotation and then a weight stack. So it goes down with the weight stack stays down for a year, and then we release the weight, and the whole thing floats up. We collect it. Uh, just some pictures of the deployment and the ROV that we use to do some of this work. And of course, this is not done in a vacuum. Many people help this is my technician, uh, Kathleen, to, to get this work done. It's a lot of tubing. Each of these experiments is that 300 meters of tubing. It's kilometers and kilometers of tubing. Um, also, the engineers that have helped to get the, the technical part done. Um, OK, so we have deployed this several times, had various issues, and I will show some data here. This is from 2012, um, from the natural oil seep. Like I said, we had some issues with getting the probe in the mud, so we were only able to collect overlying water. Uh, but it was a way to kind of show proof of principle. So up, this graph is showing chloride concentrations and then sulfate concentrations. Um, basically, it's all seawater. <laughs> uh, but we were able to show it, and, and we were able to show that seawater salinity does not change over nine months, which is great information, but a lot of work <laughs> to come up with that. Um, so the bottom seawater is salty. Um, but since then, we've been successful in doing enrichment experiments. So our, our main purpose was to look at what happens when there's oil um, coming down to these seeps. Can the microbes deal with it? Can they oxidize the oil, or are they completely uh, destroyed by it? So what we did is we made our probe tip, which is here. This is when we retrieved it. Um, we had two containers uh, filled with sediment. So this one is sediment, and then actually this there's a uh, equal one back here that's filled with just sediment from the site and then this one is sediment and oil. So we add a known amount of oil and then all of the Osmo samplers are connected to this chamber. So we have these little incubation chambers um, and uh, the idea was to determine if the microbes then can deal with the oil and at what rates um, do they oxidize. So here are some pictures of the deployment of the ship and this is the probe actually in the mud. Um, the chambers themselves are open so that uh, seawater salinity or sulfate essentially can diffuse in, just like a, a natural uh, uh, natural sample. Uh, here's the lander when we picked it up. 
Okay, so this is the, the data set. We have the control cha chamber. Sulfate concentrations are what we would expect for very little activity. This is seawater sulfate concentrations. Not much is happening. But in the oil treatment, we see that the concentrations decrease over time. Um, we just picked this, these instruments up in March. And uh, so we had about a four-month record uh, with this deployment. And you can see that sulfate reduction is occurring where there's oil and not when there's control. This seems like a, a very simple experiment, but, but what we're trying to do is this kind of experiment on the seafloor. Normally, you need to bring up mud, bring it to the lab, put it in a bottle. You do these experiments, which is great. We learn a lot of information that way, but you have bottle effects. And so the idea is that we can do these in situ under somewhat real conditions. Um, so we we're very pleased to see this kind of data. And when we compare the rates of sulfate reduction, about 0.2 millimolar, millimoles sulfate uh, per liter per day, to what has been found in the literature when a sample is brought back to the lab, it's much lower. So you know, we're kind of left at this point to wonder, is that an artifact of being on the seafloor, or is it that the rates, when you bring them back, are just not quite representative of what's occurring? Um, but what was really interesting to me is we looked at methane concentrations as well. So the orange, again, is the control, and black is the oil treatment. And we saw at the end of the, um, the, oil, the, the experiment with the oil treatment, methane concentrations began to increase at pretty high sulfate. There was still a couple millimolar sulfate. Again, that's a competitive process. So we think that we started to see some non-competitive methane generation, uh, non-competitive substrate methanogenesis occurring, which is, which is pretty cool. And uh, we've never seen that before. So we're real excited about that. Um, to show that it was, oh, excuse me, to show that it was methanogenesis, I did look at the stable isotopes of this as well, and it confirmed that that, that, that that is a, a microbial uh, production. So now we've been, we've been funded for about three years, and we've gotten to the point where we can do these enrichment experiments on the seafloor. So we're really excited um, to get a, a renewal of this funding um, over the next three years to, to then confirm what's, what is taking place um, with the, the sulfate reduction and methanogenesis. Um, again, we, we see this rates um, with, the, with the sulfate reduction being lower. So we're wondering if this is a real or an artifact. Um, we need to confirm that. And then the methanogenesis is, is, was also quite tantalizing. So just some final thoughts. Um, these seeps systems are certainly a vector for large amounts of methane to enter the ocean systems. Um, but the flux seems to be controlled by several factors, the microbial processing, um, but there's that tectonic question, uh, which of course is not known when that's going to happen, and certainly oceanography. Um, so it's difficult to characterize and really shows the need for seafloor observatories to look at, um, to look at those questions. Uh, but we have shown that the diffusive flux is quite small from, from these seeps. Um, Deepwater Horizon was a, a large input of this new carbon. I put old because it's um, petroleum carbon to the sediments. And we're still in the early stages of understanding how the microbes are dealing with that. Um, this, the, the, sh the work I showed from EcoGig is just one small part of the larger group. So we um, others are doing a lot more uh, um, additional work to, to help um, look at that issue. So with that, I hope that I've kind of brought you to a, a new place and, and shown you that it's, things are happening, things are going on. And um, I'm open for questions. Just my um, final slide showing who all helped and funding for this work.
Hey, Laura. Is everybody yeah. here? OK. So thank you for this wonderful talk. We should we learn a lot about everything. And I have questions, but if someone has questions, just click in the same bottom. Also, the people that are not in Juiz if you have questions, just click in the uh, bottom in the left down. But uh, my question for the first part of your talk is related to thermogenic uh, formations. How, how, how is it important related to the all uh, methane produced in those environments? This is my first question. And the second one is I never heard about this thermal uh, methane formation in freshwater environment. Do you know about that? Is it possible also to have in the freshwater system? So I think now you should click in your. Can you no, guys hear oh yeah. me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So for your first question, the thermogenic. Uh, oh, what? How important is how it? How big is it? Yeah. Okay. So the majority of methane that's found in hydrates is biogenic. Thermogenic is a small portion. Um, so there's a couple places where it forms. The Gulf of Mexico is, is a, a big place, a big one, uh, but then also offshore, Van, uh, um, uh, offshore Vancouver Island, that's a thermogenic system. There's a, a deep-seated, it's a little bit different because that's an a active margin, uh, so the, the, the advection of those fluids is different, but it is a thermogenic uh, area. The Caspian Sea, I believe, has thermogenic methane. So there's a few places where you see it, but the majority of methane tied up in hydrate is biogenic. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the, the biogenic methane, uh, we think, so then you have hydrate that's just methane. So the thermogenic hydrates have oil and train. There's higher hydrocarbons, ethane, uh, propane, other uh, higher uh, short chain alkanes. Um, and the seeps then that we see the, the hydrates outcrop are usually thermogenic. So we think that the, the structure itself is, um, is more stable, uh, probably because of those lar larger um, compounds related, or maybe the oil entrainment. There's still questions on that. Um, so, but the majority of hydrates are biogenic. Um, as far as freshwater systems, I do, I do know that um, in the Arctic, there are some lakes that, so I'm thinking about work off of Mackenzie River Delta. There are some lakes where they have found some thermogenic methane input. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know how much it is compared to the biogenic methane, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I don't know how, if there's other places, but, it, but I do know there is at least that one example. Yeah. Okay. And my second question is, uh, related to the osmos sample itself, you told uh, the speed, the velocity where the sample is stuck to the osmos sample is related to temperature. Is it positive relationship or a negative relationship? Like if the temperature increase, goes faster. Goes faster. Yeah. Okay. So in the end, when you take the osmos sample, the uh, length of the tube you cut which is related to time, they can be different from uh, each other. Yeah. Okay. You mean how much time it is? Ah, yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. So that's just yeah. to clarify. Yeah, it's related then to that pumping rate, which is yeah related to the temperature. So different. if you take the same distance at two different you know, warm site and a cold site, it'll be different amounts of you know, days. Yeah. OK. Does anyone have a question? Okay, so I need... This one? Again? No, this one. This? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Does people can hear me? Yeah. Yeah? You can hear me? Okay. All right. So... I was just curious, when you take the cores, you take the cores directly through the methane, through the hydrate itself, or no? No, those cores were 
just collecting sediment, so we were around the hydrates. Yeah, we, you can core the hydrate. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work, mostly in the Gulf of Mexico, that's tried to design instruments drilling uh, core barrels that can go into the hydrate itself, but it's not been that successful. It's very difficult. To get like a solid core. Yeah. Is there also like a big possibility of destabilizing it by reducing the pressure? And can there be like a catastrophic event from taking a core? I mean, I know these are such big reservoirs of carbon that have such a high potential as providing energy. Why haven't they already been used? Uh, it's difficult to get. So the the hydrate. The gas is, is contained in the hydrate, and so to get it out, you have to destabilize the hydrate. So there is um, there's a test well in uh, in Alaska, which is funded by the U.S. and Japan, um, maybe some others, but those I, I know are the big players. And that what they're trying to do is the hydrates are pretty shallow, so it's easy to drill. Um, but then they put in um, a destabilizer, some solvent. Uh, or they try to thermally heat up the system so that it drives the methane out and they can capture the gas. Um, so it takes a lot of energy to do that. And so right now, um, I think they're at a technology place where essentially what they put in um, energy-wise is what they're getting out. So it's sort of a okay. zero-sum game. Yeah. Um, Japan is very interested in, in developing the deep water hydrates, they have hydrates off their shore. Um, and But it's at this point, it's technology advancement. How can we get the gas out of the hydrate and then capture it? Um, the issue with hydrate that I didn't really say, but the stability zone is quite thin. So what you can imagine is that you might have a lot of hydrate, but it's really thin and widely dispersed. And so it's not like an oil reservoir where you have a pocket of, ga of oil that you can drill into. You have to be able to then have a lot of wells um, that's thermally destabilizing the hydrate to get enough out. So it's quite energy intensive to, to produce. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, there's still an effort to do that. Um, as the technology is advancing, you know, things are getting better and better. There's also uh, an interesting um, aspect to this, uh, to the harvesting of the methane through CO2 sequestration. So the hydrate cage can hold other, um, not just hydrocarbons, it can hold carbon dioxide. And so what they do, and it actually does that better. And so what they're doing is they're pumping in uh, CO2 into a hydrate system, having it sort of push out the methane and then they have these wells that are collecting the gas then that's coming out. Um, and they're doing that in the, this test well in, in Alaska. So there's some, you know, if they're able to sequester CO2 and get the, the methane out, there, you know, there, there's some advantages to that. So the, the, uh, the lattice formation will preferentially take in the CO2 and, and push out the methane? Yeah, it's only been shown on lab scale hydrates, though. So they're just now beginning to go in the field and see if they can do that on a larger scale. Do you but think, is there, is there even like a reasonable time scale to think how far away we are from accessing and, and producing viable wells economically? I've, yeah, I've heard people say maybe 10 years. So it's actually not as far away. Uh, but but I, I don't, you know, we don't really know. Okay. It kind of depends on how things go with e economies and, you know, if there's an investment in that. Um, the U.S., the Department of Energy is still funding this. They were funding it a lot more five years ago. So things are kind of dwindling. But well, didn't they have like an increasing funding and then now it's decreasing again? Yeah. Okay. It's decreasing it goes down by now. one million a year? No. Oh, that's the BP money. That's the, oh, okay. the yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But uh, just one last question. So there, there isn't a potential, I've heard a lot of, I don't know how reasonable these things are, but uh, it could have, there was large methane releases that could have caused mass extinctions, extinctions yes. in the past. Uh, could that be a possibility with the climate change increasing temperatures, de decreasing the stability, and causing kind of a snowball effect where 
Yeah, so there is evidence that um, that large changes in temperature in the past were caused by gas hydrates. Um, and they see that by the, the isotopes, they can follow that. There's still some debate on whether it was wetlands or, or, or hydrates, but um, the amount of carbon that's tied up in hydrates could certainly, if it was all released at once, could certainly cause a, a positive feedback to, to warming. Um, and so it's one of those things that's implicated a lot, um, but, but uh, we don't really know. Um, but in fact, with the, the oil spill, there was a paper that tried to make uh, a claim that this was very similar to if you lost a lot of, because there was about 50% gas that was contained in the what was coming out, not just oil, um, and uh, as a release of hydrate from the deep sea. Um, and they went back soon after the oil spill and just did surface water measurements of methane and found very little methane. So they're, again, making this case that, yeah, you have all this methane coming out and most of it's controlled in the water column. Um, but the time scales are way different. I mean, that was, you know, on geological time scales, it could be a mm -hmm. major player. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, I think there's a question from Pedro. Oh, we can't hear you, Pedro. Let's see if looks like Nathan still has the microphone. Oh. That sounds promising. Oh, maybe, and Zach, I think you have a microphone. I don't know. I don't know how this works. <laughs> maybe he will write the question. We can see your text, that's good. Can you guys still see, hear me? No, we can't hear you. But we can see your text. Maybe you can write the question. Okay, the in situ experiments. Yes. Ah, okay. So it was, um, yeah, I think conclusion is probably a strong, <laughs> a strong, is, we had an indication. The sulfate concentrations were still a couple millimolar. I think it was four or five millimolar. And from a lot of work that has been done um, with competitive substrates such as carbon dioxide um, and hydrogen, um, that methanogenesis can't proceed when sulfate reducers are competing for those, um, for the hydrogen mostly. So the, the fact that we started to see methane concentrations increase when there was still so much sulfate made us think that we might have non-competitive substrate methanogenesis 
So along with the CO2 reduction as a methanogenic pathway, we also know that um, methane is formed from, um, from other substrates uh, that the sulfate reducers don't use. And so there's a possibility that that's what could be happening. Um, but we don't know that. We need to verify that some more with other, with other techniques. So for example, we could add some of these other substrates um, in future experiments to the, to the chambers and see if we get methanogenesis. Um, we can start to manipulate the system a little bit different than just adding oil. Does that help? OK. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> OK. I think. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There it goes. Here? Yeah. Is it? Is it OK? Yeah. Good. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for the inspiring presentation, because even though in our group we work a lot with uh, greenhouse gases, at least I know very little about the chemistry behind the methane and especially this <clears throat> special uh, things about the methane uh, emission processes, especially in the deep systems like that. So it was really, really nice. I have a quick question. And um, it was when you talked in the beginning and you mentioned that you calculated the um, the flux of methane from the sediment to the water through the gradient in the sediment. Does that assume, or is there no methane oxidation as well in this top sediment? Is, is it just like the, the decrease in concentration? Is it just due to the flux? How, how do you do it? Yeah, so the, um, the assumption is that if you're right at the surface, the sediment water interface, um, that all the ox the me most of the methane has been oxidized once it goes diffuses up through anaerobic methane oxidation and sulfate reduction. I mean, it's 85 percent is probably, and that's why you see that the gradient, the concentrations go down so close to the sea surface, the sediment water interface. Um, it what it does ignore though is aerobic methane oxidation right in the upper couple of centi maybe centimeter millimeters. Um, and that we, we don't account for. So we're just saying we're ignoring it. We're just saying this is the, this is the gradient to, that's why I do usually make a point to say it's to the sediment water interface, but there's still, you know, possibly some oxidation that we don't, ha we don't know very well what those rates are, aerobic methane. But is there oxygen in the top sediment in this deep system? Uh, it's millimeters, if oh. even that. It's really thin then it shouldn't be a lot. Because what I'm thinking is actually the flux that you have is the sum of the flux and the oxidation. But if there is little oxygen, then the oxidation in the surface water, in the, the yeah, the, the overlaying water is very small, probably. Yeah, but, well, certainly in the upper sediments. Um, the bottom water itself is, there's probably quite a bit of methane oxidation. And that we don't, we're, we're, we're not accounting for. Um, and in fact, there's very little work done on aerobic methane oxidation in these seep systems until the oil spill. So I imagine in the next year or two, we're going to get a lot of papers coming out on who was doing it, what kind of rates, because that was a really big factor. Um, you know, they saw all this methane coming out of the seep, and then, and then it disappeared. Um, and so the people have been following that, and, and now we're going to know a lot more, um, hopefully because it's a very understudied process, but yet really important. Yeah. Yeah. The question is mainly because we, use, we are planning to use kind of the same approach in the reservoirs, but we can have quite a lot of oxygen and down to the bottom. So but it's a good, thanks. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe we should. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> OK, I think Emma's going to get set up here. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>